Well, welcome everyone again. We have Holly May here, our son. Holly. And come on in. Captain Jason Strong, Chaplain, will you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you, Governor. I invite you to join with me as I pray. Dear God, I come to you today as gold is refined by fire. I'd ask that, Lord, that you would use Hurricane Dorian as a catalyst to bring out everything that is good and great in the people in the state of South Carolina. I thank you for Team uh, South Carolina, as led by Governor McMasters, and pray and ask your blessing and your wisdom on them as they lead and support us in these things. For I humbly ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, sir. Well, <clears throat> As you know, Hurricane Dorian is a now a Category 2 hurricane with sustained winds of over 110 miles an hour. The entire coast of South Carolina is either under a hurricane watch or a hurricane warning. South Carolina is still in the path of what is a very destructive and deadly storm. As you have seen, the current forecast shows sustained hurricane winds coming our way. Now what that means is sustained hurricane winds are not gusts, but winds of 75 miles an hour or more. That's demonstrated in the red color there on that, that chart. Those are sustained winds. And <clears throat> that will be, as you can see, only four or five, maybe six miles off the coast of Charleston when it gets here and will, should actually hit Georgetown and Ory counties if it keeps going in the direction in which it is predicted. But as you also know, these predictions, are, some are exact and some are wrong, but that is, that is the best estimate at this time. The gusts of wind, we have gusts uh, above hurricane, excuse me, hurricane force gusts may reach farther inland than even the red showing on that chart there at this time and <clears throat> they may go further inland and sustain tropical forest winds those are winds of over 39 miles an hour might even go even farther and those are represented by the blue color that you see on that chart to put this in perspective last week i visited a dredge it's a texas dredge you may have read about it it's, it's digging dredging the channel out at leading into the harbor in charleston and it was five or six miles out, and it would be within that red section on the chart there. It is within the sustained 75 miles an hour. We were sitting on the dredge, and you could see see land. You could see, see the houses. You could see everything. That's how close it is. And I say again, one side of that red line is 75 and above, and one inch on the other side is 74, just under 75. And just a movement of a mile or two will make a huge difference. So we're urging everybody to, to be safe. Also, in addition to that, the storm surge, that is the water coming in. We're talking about wind, but the water, the storm surge, on top of already higher than usual tides that are forecast, are expected to be uh, resulting from six to 10 inches of rainfall. All this creates the possibility of dramatic flooding in the low country, especially in Charleston, where the tide could rise to over 10 feet, 10.3 feet, it's estimated, which is about five feet higher than usual at regular high tide. So our message for today is this. This is a very serious storm, and a western shift that is towards land of just a few miles could bring enormous damage to our state. So we want everyone to heed the warnings, listen to the official instructions that are given, and we want to prepare for the worst, but of course, well, we want to pray for the best. So today, again, we repeat this message. If you are in the evacuation zones, in the eight counties mentioned earlier along the coast, the time to leave is now. The lane reversal on I-26 is going very smoothly, and Secretary Christie Hall will provide more information about that in a moment. As for Highway 278 at Hilton Head, that reversal went smoothly as well, but we've ended that reversal as traffic has returned back 
to normal. If we need to re-implement the reversal on 278, we can do that very quickly. As for school and government closings, schools and state government offices will remain closed tomorrow. That is Wednesday, September the 4th. They're closed today. This is Tuesday. They'll be closed tomorrow on Wednesday, September the 4th in the following counties, the same as we announced earlier and the same as in which they are closed today. And that is Jasper, Beaufort, Colleton, Charleston, Berkeley, Dorchester, Georgetown, and Ori. They will remain closed in those counties, those eight counties, until further notice. There are no additional school or state government closings to announce at this time, and I'll now call on Adjutant General John McCarthy. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the South Carolina National Guard has approximately 1,200 soldiers, airmen, and members of our State Guard currently deployed, helping to support the evacuation and the law enforcement mission. We're also looking to prepare ourselves for the reentry and recovery operations. We're looking to bring in some high water vehicles and some debris clearance teams to help uh, in the necessary evacuations if that occurs. Uh, we're working with uh, neighboring states of West Virginia and Kentucky to bring in additional aircraft that will be available to support uh, aerial uh, search, search and rescue if needed. Uh, we work with the state fire marshal office there with our South Carolina park teams, our helicopter aquatic rescue teams. Uh, so we're bringing in four additional U-860 uh, Blackhawk helicopters to be uh, available for that purpose. Uh, we're just monitoring the situation and looking to be prepared for whatever uh, Hurricane Dorian brings. Thank you, Governor. John Quirrell. Thank you, Governor. I'd like the Governor have mentioned life-threatening storm surge and dangerous winds are expected along the South Carolina coast regardless of the exact track of Dorian Center. Uh, currently, again, Dorian has winds of 110 miles an hour. It's finally starting to pull away from the northern Bahamas. Speeds are only about three miles an hour, but it's no longer stationary. It's going to continue to lift northward off the Florida and Georgia coast through tomorrow. The Hurricane Center forecast has actually been very consistent for the past couple of days, showing the center of Dorian passing just off the South Carolina coast Wednesday night and Thursday as a dangerous hurricane. Dorian will be growing in size as it passes off the South Carolina coast. So even if the center stays just offshore, there will be significant impacts felt not only along the coast, but also extending inland as well. Any shift in the track closer to the coast, which does remain possible, would result in more significant impacts as the governor described. Currently, hurricane conditions are expected along the South Carolina coast Wednesday night and Thursday, with tropical storm force winds extending inland beyond the I-95 corridor. Even more concerning is the storm surge potential. Major coastal flooding could begin late Wednesday morning, but the most significant storm surge will occur later Wednesday into Thursday, when water could rise four to seven feet above ground level along parts of the coast. So that's taking tides and everything else out of it. That's just how high the water could get. In particular locations, the water could get four to seven feet above ground level uh, along parts of the coast. That's pretty significant. In addition, heavy rainfall could produce more than five to 10 inches of rain across coastal areas, likely resulting in flash flooding. If you live along the coast and haven't prepared yet because you feel Dorian won't be a threat because the center is forecast to pass offshore, you're making a mistake. Remember, this storm will bring significant impacts to the coast, including life-threatening storm surge, which will enter structures and may make roads impassable. If you wait until the last minute to leave on Wednesday, you may not be able to because some of those low-lying coastal roadways may already be flooded from the morning high tide and, and stay high through the day, so you can't wait last minute. And obviously, the strong Hurricane force winds or even tropical storm force winds will bring down trees and result in a lot of power outages as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Hall. Thank you, Governor. Secretary of Transportation. Thank you, sir. As the Governor mentioned already, uh, the I-26 reversal has worked very effectively for us. Uh, we continue to see heavy traffic movement all across the state, especially along the I-26 uh, corridor. Uh, Director Smith briefed yesterday that the reversal was implemented about an hour and a half ahead of schedule yesterday, effective at 10.30 a.m. As I mentioned, heavy volumes traveled up I-26 through noon today. 
the, the last data point that we checked, as of noon today, we continue to see <coughs> elevated traffic numbers on I-26. As a matter of fact, on I-26 at the noon count, we saw what we expected to see today, which was an increase again, just like we saw yesterday with those traffic numbers climbing throughout the day. And uh, based on our noontime count station, we were seeing 3,200 vehicles per hour traveling on I-26, which is well above normal capacity for that section of interstate. A lot of vehicles were obviously using the reverse side of the, the interstate to uh, exit the area uh, westbound to get to uh, area safety. Since the evacuation order was put into place and we reversed traffic on I-26, we've had a total of 54,000 vehicles traveling westbound and that in the westbound direction that's on both sides including an 11,000 uh, vehicle count on the reverse side by itself to try to get people out of the harm's way up I-26 westbound to safety. That reversal will remain in place for as long as we feel like it's required in order to keep people safe and handle the traffic volumes that are evacuating from these areas. I want to speak just briefly about our estimated evacuee numbers. That's one of the data points that we look at relative to uh, our uh, traffic control measures. We estimate that since the governor's uh, evacuation order, and this is through 8 a.m. this morning, that we've had 244,000 evacuees leave the coastal area of the state, 88,000 of which we estimate were, estimated were carried on I-26 alone through that same time period through 8 a.m. Briefly, just to remind everybody on the, uh, the reversal that's in place, in order to get on the reverse side of the interstate, we ask that you enter that reversal there at the I-526 interchange to travel westbound. There are eight interchanges that you can exit as you travel towards Columbia uh, in order to get off that section of the reverse side of the interstate. On the westbound side, in order to get on, if you're not gonna <coughs> ride on the reverse side, of the interstate. There are multiple access points to get on I-26 westbound in the, in the region and that includes Ashley Phosphate, US-52, US-78 or Ladson exit, College <coughs> Park Road, and US-17A. We still have uh, access available along I-95 at the I-26 interchange for those that need it and we will continue to make adjustments to this traffic pattern as required based on field conditions. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, our total law enforcement and National Guard uh, staffing remains at 2,785. Uh, all local evacuation uh, routes are operating uh, very uh, smoothly. And, and last, I just would like to uh, ask the motoring public not to cross the median into uh, the reverse lanes. Traffic pulling out of the median at a very slow speed while other traffic is approaching at interstate speed could be very, very dangerous. Uh, please follow the instruction of officials during this evacuation period. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Keel, Good afternoon. Uh, state law enforcement, uh, primarily SLED, DNR, and Triple P at this point, we continue to support the emergency uh, traffic management unit with the evacuations. We'll continue to do that with the lane reversals until the evacuations are complete. DNR and SLED aircraft are available uh, to assist in those lane reversals or any other law enforcement mission at this time. This morning we had uh, 80 uh, MPs from the South Carolina National Guard that joined our state law enforcement folks on the coast in the different conglomerates. They will be providing security for post-storm missions we also have staff here, obviously, at the CIOP, and DNR began the river sweeps uh, earlier this morning at, at 8 o'clock. As of this afternoon, we have 445 state law enforcement personnel uh, along the coast, in addition to those 80 uh, National Guard MPs, so that's 525 personnel. As I said yesterday, uh, individuals who think that they're going to take advantage of this situation and uh, harm people's property uh, while they're out, uh, they will be caught, they will be arrested, and they will go to jail. Uh, law enforcement is going to be out in force uh, when this evacuation 
is over and people have left their homes, uh, these law enforcement uh, officers will be moving into those evacuated areas to protect people's property. And again, there will be a zero tolerance for lawlessness. Thank you, Chief. Rick Toomey, Department of Health and Environmental Control. Thank you, Governor. Yes, sir. Currently, we have 221 staff across the state mobilized for storm preparation and response efforts. We continue to assist. The healthcare facilities are in the process of evacuating their patients and residents in advance of the storm. And we are, our dam safety team are currently conducting pre-storm dam assessments today. Governor, thank you. Thank you, sir. Michael Leach, Director of Department of Social Services. Thank you, Governor. Sir. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll begin with an update on shelters. Uh, as the state agency lead for mass care operations, DSS is working alongside our partners, county emergency managers, the American Red Cross, Department of Health and Environmental Control, the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, the National Guard, and others to ensure shelters are adequately staffed and equipped to serve the citizens who have followed orders of evacuation. South Carolina currently has 20 shelters open across the state, including 15 general population shelters and five medical need shelters. Of these shelters, 13 are utilizing school buildings. As of 145, we have a total population of 410 individuals in our shelters. This number includes 400 general population clients and 10 medical needs clients. The local emergency management teams have let us know their needs for COTS and the National Guard is actively working to transport COTS to shelters now. We are tracking these efforts. We have nine general population shelters on standby and 19 medical needs shelters on standby. Our total capacity is 10,000 and we are at 3% of that capacity. Uh, following our mission to provide for the safety and well-being of children, youth, and vulnerable adults, the DSS Child Welfare, Adult Advocacy, and Economic Services teams have been working around the clock to contact every licensed foster home, group home, child care center, and, indivi and individuals in adult protective services and the evacuation zones to make sure we have appropriate plans um, for these individuals. Thank you, sir. Chief Jonathan Jones, State Fire Marshal. Thank you, Governor. Uh, State Fire, along with our other search and rescue partners, uh, including uh, many, many local fire departments from across the state, began staging search and rescue resources and swift water rescue resources uh, closer to the coast today. Um, currently, uh, just from South Carolina resources, we have the South Carolina Helicopter Aquatic Rescue Team, which is a partnership between um, our office, local fire departments, and the South Carolina National Guard. Um, we also have urban search and rescue teams uh, that are going to be staged uh, closer to the coast, as well as uh, up to 19 swift water rescue boat teams. Uh, that are going to be available. That totals about 100 rescuers uh, in total. Um, a lot of them from the Midlands, from the upstate counties, uh, fire departments that are sending help to their neighboring fire departments there on the coast. Um, and uh, that's in addition to the local firefighters and rescue workers um, who will be protecting their own backyards and the jurisdictions that they serve on a regular basis. Um, in addition, FEMA Urban Search and Rescue is going to have federal uh, rescue teams here uh, in state staged and, and for the ready um, should they be needed. Um, our incident support team, the Palmetto Incident Support Team, has been working with the Louisiana State Fire Marshal's Office incident support team uh, most of this week, uh, planning for this staging event as well as search and rescue and swift water rescue activities. Um, tomorrow we're actually going to be joined by a FEMA incident support team and uh, we'll actually form a uh, joint unified support team to uh, continue to plan for rescue responses. So far we've received requests from uh, Berkeley County for eight additional firefighters that have been supplied from an upstate fire department and we've also received a few requests uh, for um, uh, swift water rescue teams to support some coastal communities. Thank you. Thank you sir. Kim Stenson. Emergency Management Division. Thank you, sir. There's really no change in our priorities here at the State Emergency Operations Center. Uh, we're still executing evacuation and sheltering operations, as you've heard earlier. Uh, but at the same time, we're also planning for uh, initial response, damage assessment, uh, re-entry, and recovery, uh, which will take place in the, in the future. 
at the county level, there's 19 counties uh, with their emergency operations centers that are uh, operational at some status. We have nine of them that are at OPCON 2, Operating Condition 2, uh, which is the second highest level of readiness. Uh, and we've got 10 at Operating Condition 1, OPCON 1, which is the highest level of uh, readiness, similar to what we are here at the State Emergency Operations Center. Uh, and we've also uh, got our EMD personnel still deployed and will stay deployed down in the coastal counties to help with situ situational awareness and any, any requests they might have. Uh, there are right now six county governments uh, that were closed today, and that's uh, Beaufort, Berkeley, Charleston, Colleton, Dorchester, and Jasper. In the logistics area, we currently have 189 requests, and that number is changing. It's probably changed since I last got it here. Uh, but of those 189, the latest data point that I've got, 123 are either completed or in progress, uh, and the remaining are being uh, actioned. And the requests range anywhere from cots to generators, and you've also already heard some of the requests that uh, was already reported out. Um, and then uh, on the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, and that's getting uh, assets from out of state. Right now we've only got three uh, active uh, uh, projects there. One is a team that came in from Tennessee to help us uh, manage future EMAC requests, out of state requests. Uh, Chief Jones already mentioned the incident management team uh, that's assisting him. And then General McCarty also mentioned the additional air support. Uh, and just would, in closing, just uh, kind of remind everybody uh, to still use our website, seend.org, uh, and also our mobile uh, ma uh, emergency manager ma app to help you. Uh, uh, manage your way through this disaster. Uh, on the website and mobile app is our Know Your Zone uh, module there, and you can type in your address and find out uh, if in fact you're in an evacuation zone, and if so, what evacuation zone you're in. And then lastly, uh, we've got our public information phone system at State Hotline uh, for citizens to call in and get information uh, in regards to evacuation or sheltering or any other questions that they might have and we'll get an answer for them. And that's at one 866 246-0133 and Spanish interpreters are available. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. For Director Stinson, um, I know um, compliant, residents, resident compliance has been a big thing. I know for Matthew and Florence we saw 15, 60 percent. Any concerns that out of the 830,000 people in those evacuation areas that we're only seeing about 250,000 leave? Well, I, we'll have to look at those numbers as they come in. I'm sure there's going to be an uptick here uh, through the, uh, the afternoon and the evening. But I, I would say, on average, that's about the same what we've seen here recently in the last couple of uh, uh, events. And it just changes from event to event. But I think we're heading in the right direction. Governor McMaster. Yes, sir. Um, I know you, you talked a little bit about the storm surge there <laughs> being something that you guys are focused on. I know it's still some time out from that. but. How much of a focus at this point are you guys thinking about with, especially after Florence, a lot of the flooding in the PD and, you know, the low country and things like that, how much of a focus is on that storm surge? It's, it's different to compare one to the other, particularly when the, this one isn't here yet. And uh, it, it's, it's very unpredictable. As you know, no one would have predicted that Dorian would have essentially parked for 24 hours. It moved 20, 25 miles, I think, in, in 24 hours. Uh, so. It's very difficult to predict, but we know that there'll be a lot of rain, six to, I think, six to ten inches of rain is forecast, six to eight, six to ten, depending on where we are. That'll land on shore, go into the rivers, that'll be coming to the, to the ocean. And then, of course, the, the storm will be pushing the ocean in even above the high tide level. So we are confident that we will have a lot of flooding. Uh, we know that there are various maps that, that predict it, but we'll be able to predict it better when we get closer. But that's why you hear all the... It, it, uh, all this uh, machinery and all people being moved into place is, is one of the things that we would need help with the flood. We saw videos of uh, people crossing the, the, the medians during during the evacuation. Any idea how many people will be ticketed, or is there any more information about the enforcement? Uh, the uh, median crossing has been very sporadic, but our message is the focus isn't on uh, enforcement. The focus is on public safety. With. 244,000 evacuated, but only 400 or so in shelters. Do you think they're going to hotels, family, and other parts of the state? Where do you think all these people are going if they're not in the shelters? Typically, that's what we see. A very small percentage of the total evacuated population will actually seek shelters. Historically, it's usually 5% or less. 
so you know they'll go to family and friends. They'll you know go to hotels. Uh, but I, I expect that there'll probably be an increase in the number of people sheltered as time goes on. Any guess? But, but it, as uh, Director Leach mentioned earlier, we're prepared for it. We've got capacity of about 10,000 if, if necessary, so we're prepared. Of the 244,000 who have left, any guess on the, what the breakdown is for tourists versus uh, residents? Y yes, on the, uh, the 240, uh, 244 number, we have already uh, factored in what we would consider normal Labor Day um, tourists leaving the area and so this is outside of that air outside of the tourist population so we believe that out of the number we're probably looking at maybe 10 to 15 percent of that being tourist the rest of it is anticipated to be uh, evacuees from the uh, residential areas secretary hall can you talk about uh, for people planning to leave tonight maybe those eight exits on the reverse lanes that are open and why more aren't open can you explain how you decide which ones to open well, it's uh, the decision on the uh, which lanes are open on the reverse side is really to provide uh, periodic, regular intervals for uh, folks traveling on the reverse side to be able to get off to refuel, to, to take a rest break, or if their destination is somewhere other than Columbia, to give them those avenues and opportunities. Um, with the eight interchange uh, areas accessible on the reverse side, we believe that that provides ample opportunity for individuals to uh, make their personal plans with regards to where their final destination is and how to get there. Also, while you're up there, I know you mentioned that um, we're seeing about 3,200 vehicles per hour, which is well above the normal capacity. What is the usual capacity for, for our 26? About 3,000 vehicles per hour is, uh, is our planning number uh, on capacity. And as I said earlier at noon today, Beginning at 9 today, we started seeing increased numbers uh, on I-26, and then at noon today, we hit a number that would have exceeded traditional capacity available. So clearly the, the reversal was still needed today in order to ensure we didn't have gridlock on I-26 today. Governor McMaster, yes. I know you say this every year, but for people that may be experiencing this for the first time, can you please reiterate what will happen if they choose to stay in regards to emergency response? Well, they might not be able to get out after after a while. If the water gets too deep or the wind's too bad and electric lines coming down, uh, some over 50 miles an hour, and you start losing electric lines. Some of them are, are newer and stronger, and some of them are on the ground. But it, it, when it becomes too dangerous for the rescuers to go in, then everybody's on their own. So to be safe, you need to leave those those areas that have been declared for the evacuation. That's that's the only way to be safe. And, and right now, with the roads open, as been described, it's, it's working smoothly. There's no trouble at all in getting out. There's plenty of gas and uh, plenty of room to leave. And the best the best thing to do is is to be safe. Don't be sorry. Be safe. Leave. You can always come back. Secretary Hall, uh, last year with uh, Florence, um, we saw um, some issues with the uh, US 501 in the Conway area that required um, some flood barriers. Are there any concerns uh, about uh, that roadway or, or other roads, um, people having access in and out? I think SC9 was also kind of a, an issue last year in the PD region. Well, as John Q described, we're starting to really turn our attention now towards storm surge and doing the analysis necessary to determine what protective measures need to be uh, put into place early. I don't have a firm answer on that yet. We're still doing the analysis. Um, at this point in time, I haven't identified that as one of the areas of concern. However, we do know that uh, with uh, king tides and uh, with the possibility of the storm surge, clearly we're, we're anticipating issues down in some of our low country area where we traditionally see issues, say, around the Edisto Causeway <coughs> And uh, US 21, obviously, we're looking very, very closely at those uh, relative to the values that are being predicted now. It's a little too early, uh, as the governor mentioned, to uh, for us to, to uh, put something in place today on that. We're still continuing the planning activities, watching the forecast very close, working very closely with John Q and the National Weather Service. More to come on that as, as we move forward in time. No what's, what's included in the pre-storm dam assessments, and if things are not up to par, how do you guys address that? Mr. Toomey. 
Uh, our team, dam safety team, is out there looking at putting eyes on, assessing it, looking to make sure the spillways are clear, uh, that there's no debris that may impact it, um, and that's based on the assessment that we were out looking at the dams back in July as well as a pre-inventory uh, before the uh, season. Uh, but we identified certain dams within the coastal area that could be at risk and as of today we're visiting each and every one of those identified in the six or eight county area. More questions? What's, uh, what's... Anybody asking? No, you're All right, doing perfect. Good. All right, what's, uh, what's being done for maybe South Carolinians that uh, don't have cars, don't have a mode of transportation to evacuate from these areas? There are buses. Right, all the counties have plans to do that if they need to do that. Uh, Charleston's got a very detailed plan for their population that does not have do not have uh, transportation uh, to make sure that they get to a shelter. So all counties have plans for that, and if they need additional resources, then uh, we can assist. And we've got a reserve of buses right now that is down in Orangeburg. We can help with that if they need to. But so far, we haven't had any requests. No question. Yes, sir. Yeah, just one more. Secretary Hall, um, just a little bit of a follow-up with the 501 <coughs> question um, that happened there. I know, again, it's way too early to, to know for sure, but does the Department of Transportation feel that the sandbags, that may have been the most effective way to at least kind of cut down on the flooding um, last year, keeping those roadways open? Uh, look, we used a lot of different innovative techniques last year in order to try to keep the various highways open. We actually used three different types of uh, devices, the aqua dams, the sandbags as you described them, and then a, another uh, a concrete type device with a plastic facing on it to try to hold back the water. All three of those devices proved successful for us. Uh, the good thing is, is that we when, uh, when we instituted the aqua dams last year in the Georgetown area, we actually bought and purchased those assets, so we have those stored and ready to go. Where we're, wherever we need them, we're ready to deploy them based on our analysis. So um, different circumstances are going to require different things, but the main message is, is that we're doing the analysis, and if and when we need those, we'll, we will have them prepositioned and ready to go and in place in advance of, of uh, any flooding issues. And Governor, um, we've talked a lot about cruise ships along the coast. Have there been any, any delays to cargo going in and out of Charleston and other areas along the coast that you're concerned about? <coughs> I know the Ports Authority is on top of that. I can yeah, report on that, yes sir. So, um, the Carnival Cruise came in yesterday um, and uh, that was the, the big push for them with regards to the, the passenger onload, onload and off guard, offload. The port is actually planning on ceasing operations for the next couple of days uh, as the storm comes through, and then they, of course, will reopen when it's safe for them to do so. More questions? Um, are you finding that people are using the public information phone line, and if so, what are their biggest concerns? What are they calling about? What are they asking? So far, we've had a relatively small number of people that have actually called in, uh, but most of the uh, questions have to do with evacuation and sheltering. Specifically, uh, you know, where this, the closest shelter is from wherever they're calling. Oh, and again, uh, remind everybody that we've got our mobile app uh, that allows them to uh, access information on shelters and, uh, and you know, all that know your zone information. So that's an excellent. And all, again, the website also has all the shelters listed as well. Joe, thank you very much.